hello everyone. Thank you for uh, having me and inviting me for this presentation. So I'm going to talk about this very thorny and tricky question. Should we stop having children to save the planet? So a few words about me. Uh, I'm an engineer. I've been um, studying this topic for uh, at least three years since I've uh, written an article about the question of uh, population and climate change. Uh, the first uh, version was in 2019 and uh, there is an English version now. And since then uh, I, have write, uh, I have written a book in French that goes into much more details and I will probably continue with a PhD on the question of the links between population, population growth, the ecological crisis and so on. So I start with the first question, which is uh, about the uh, human population growth. Is it an exploding bomb? So you probably heard of this book, which has been a, a bestseller in 1968, uh, called The Population Bomb by Paul Ehrlich. And uh, the thesis of this book is that uh, our population is growing uncontrollably and that soon population, uh, people will starve, population would crash and uh, the environment would be totally destroyed. So you've seen that none of these things actually happened, but we still have uh, an ecological crisis and population, of course, is a question. So when you look at the human population numbers since the beginning of history, it actually looks like a bomb. Where, where will it stop? Um, of course, it's frightening, but uh, when you zoom on, the, on the, uh, this picture, actually, you realize that the population growth is already flattening, that the growth rate is decreasing since uh, its maximum in 1968, the year of the population boom, and that the human population should peak around, well, let's say, between 10 and 11 billion, and between 2050 and 2100. No one has a crystal ball about where population uh, is going, but we still have great, um, the, the big trends. And the big trend is that gross uh, fertility rates are uh, decreasing everywhere in the world. So at some point, human population will start will stop growing. This does not mean that uh, there isn't any question, and especially maybe that even if human population will probably stabilize, we may be too many. So too many, but too many for what? The first question, which was a question from the population bomb, but also from a lot of the literature and the pop culture from this time, for example, Southern Grint. So Glenn Green uh, is, uh, is a sci-fi movie happening in our year where people are starving and at some point they may have to eat other people. And it's uh, really a symbol of the, this time where people were frightened that we would be too many and we couldn't feed everyone. So can we feed 10 or 11 billion people that we will very probably reach? Actually, there are Dozens of studies are about how to reach it. And the main uh, things to do are first eat less meat, because actually a lot of meat um, is um, a lot of cereals and uh, other plant products are eaten currently by animals. For example, we have a, a grain crisis, but uh, around half of the world cereal production goes to uh, feed. And the other uh, big item is uh, reduce waste. Humanity wastes about one third of every food it produces. So actually, even today, there is far, far enough um, food to feed everyone. It's a political question, and who can, aff who can afford it? Let's go uh, further to the climate question. So when you split uh, the um, people emissions uh, from the consumptions, they realized that about half of uh, emissions are from the richest 10% of the population. So actually, how many people there are, and actually 
what is the population growth among poor people in the world, because actually this is where population is still growing, doesn't really matter. It's not the big question. The big question is what are these 10% richest people uh, doing? And how would they decarbonize their lifestyles, their society, their politics? And it's one of the uh, big traps from uh, about this debate, because almost every article, even well-meaning articles that you would see, are showing Indian, African women, and so on. And actually, the ecological question is mostly about white people. So even the, uh, with uh, these numbers, would reducing human population be ecologically useful, especially in rich countries where most of the pollution is. So I ask myself a question, what would happen if we would uh, institute the one child policy uh, in France? So tomorrow, people can only have one child. And there are actually very different ways to uh, set it because the one child policy in China was actually between 1.5 and 2.5 children by one, per woman. And it will really depend about how it's done, what are the exceptions, uh, can people pay the fine, and so on. So I drew a few scenarios. Uh, France currently has a fertility rate about 1.9 uh, children per woman. And having a very soft one-child policy would reduce it to 1.6, and the harsh policy would reduce it to 1.1. And so this is the population. What will happen? So it's not counting immigration, but only natural uh, birth. And you see that actually you have to wait 2,100, the end of the century, to uh, divide the population by two. So it's the first uh, thing that's very important when you speak about population measures, demographics, is that the momentum is huge. It really takes a lot of time to uh, change uh, the, the direction of the population. But there are more momentums. There is another one. It's that uh, babies have actually low emissions. Adults consume, consume a lot. Children, not that much. So we have the black curve about what are the current uh, emissions by age. And then in the future, these emissions will probably go down. So at what reason? We have two curves. The first one, the, other, the upper one, the blue, uh, the dark blue one, is if uh, emissions uh, degrow slowly, the current rate about minus 10% per year. And the uh, light one is uh, if they, grow, they, <coughs> they decrease fast, which is the uh, Paris uh, objective to limit uh, global warming to 1.5 degrees. So actually, when you see these curves, you realize that the impact is much slower, it's much lower in the long term because emissions will be lower. So what happens uh, with uh, warming? What really determines global warming is not the emissions by year, it's cumulative emissions. It's how much you add, how much CO2 you add, uh, uh, both, uh, in, in the long run. And if you uh, reduce population, it will actually take some time to have this effect in cumulative emissions. So you realize that actually when you, uh, read, when you institute the first the one child policy, the effect, the long-term effect in 2100 is actually very small because emissions by person have been have decreased a lot by that time. So this effect is even lower than we could think. So it's really not a silver bullet. Even something that's arch and anti-freedom and anti-fundamental rights as uh, the one-child policy would only reduce cumulative emissions by a few percent. And there are deeper questions with this um, with this uh, reasoning, with this calculation. Uh, we are used to uh, formulas like Kaya or IPAT equation. You probably heard if you studied uh, environment. Uh, 
uh, and where population is supposed to be a multiplicative factor. And this means that if we would be like half the po world population, we would be we would have half the population, half the pollution. And this is what happens in the, the Avengers movie when the bad guy decides to divide the population by two. And we are supposed to believe that it would solve the ecological crisis. There are actually many weaknesses with this reasoning, because even if we were half the population, we would have to decarbonize most of our society. If we were half the population, would already half of the old ways coal mine would close? Would states choose to respect their climate pledges, not like now? Would lobbies start stop uh, promoting uh, destructive policies? Would the culture of consumerism, consumerism disappear? Nothing at all. So actually, it's really a, a very poor fix to our to our problems and probably things would go out, continue like before and we would just win a bit of time. And we will finish by the individual question because in the first part of the presentation, we were uh, thinking about the, the society, humanity and so on. Uh, as an individual, should you have children? You probably read this kind of headlines where uh, having a child is presented as the worst thing you can do for the environment. Uh, this all comes from a, a study for 2017 that uh, calculates uh, the CO2 impact of having a child and which um, comes up with a suspiciously large number. So this around 60 tons of CO2. 60 tons of CO2, it's like the, uh, the uh, carbon footprint of six people. So how can having one child have the carbon footprint of six people? It's very, uh, it's very weird or it's very questionable. The authors chose to uh, count every emissions of your child, their offspring, they are not doing anything and for the end of the world. So this asks a lot of questions. Uh, the first one is that it's really not like uh, stopping uh, a car, uh, going vegetarian and not taking a plane and so on, because these things are calculated by engineers. These are life cycle analysis. And they are uh, actual numbers that are measures and that are uh, that correspond to short term emissions. This carbon heritage, that is the 60 ton, is hypothetical emissions in the very far future. So it's really not the same thing at all. And it's, I would say, dishonest to compare the two. But there are more, more issues. Uh, they have to take hypothesis about. Uh, what would be the future emissions and what would be the future fertility. The scenarios with emissions is that the uh, CO2 emissions by person would be stable until the end of time. Of course, it's not possible. We have limited quanti quantities of fossil fuels and the planet would have some issues in this case. And with the fertility, they choose to continue the, uh, the fertility rates that would be uh, that would that were projected by the United Nations for the end of the century, but project them until the end of time, which would mean that humanity would go extinct because of lack of babies. So of course it makes no sense at all either. And if they didn't do this, the 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 sum the the number would be infinite because when you sum emissions and humanity doesn't go extinct, it gives an, an infinite number. There are Several other issues, more philosophical, because when you compare consumer, consumer choices or having a child, it's really not the same thing. One is a fundamental right and the other is not. The other is a consumption of choice. And finally, uh, it, it uh, raises question about uh, res what is responsibility? Are you responsible, really responsible for your great, 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 great children, future pollution? 
I don't think so. And I don't think it's really a, a good thing to calculate and consider this. So um, the, the author of this study was actually interviewed uh, last year and uh, she made a, a turnaround and said that actually it's okay to have kids because this number is a very theoretical calculation which doesn't mean much. And actually the big questions are, if you have a child, how will he live and in what society? And I think it's a great conclusion for this presentation. Thank you. Ah, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Ana Bolio. I'm here from the Universidad Panamericana in Mexico. And I work at the World Youth Alliance. Um, my question is that if this, um, antenatal policies or propaganda are targeted to vulnerable groups? Yes, uh, thank you for the questions. I think uh, there are two targets. Effectively, sometimes it's to uh, vulnerable groups, but it's mostly, uh, I would say, feel good propaganda for uh, Western and richer people who would prefer to believe that the problem is uh, children in further pa parts of the world and not their own consumptions or their own parts in, uh, in capitalist society and so on. And I'm not sure, um, currently uh, there isn't that much um, coercive policies, but it's been something that's been very strong in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and especially inspired by uh, the likes of Paul Ehrlich and where uh, rich countries would uh, blackmail poorer countries and say, we wouldn't help you if uh, you don't control your birth, your birth rights. And there have been tons of abuse in many countries uh, and many of them were inspired by uh, richer countries who would say, uh, we are tough to their own electors and so on. Um, this is more of an existential uh, or, or general question. Um, I'm 26 years old and uh, people around me are starting to think about having children. And, and I know several that say, I would like to have children, but I'm too afraid to have them and put them into a world that is slowly falling apart. What would you say about that? Yeah, th thank you for the question. It's a, it's a great question and actually, I think like 70% of our generation are asking similar kinds of questions. And what I can say is that we don't have any crystal ball and that the future is not set. And actually, even if the ecological future was set, how uh, it really happens is a political choice. Uh, the question of hunger, I think it's great uh, here. Famines are political issues. There have always been enough, mostly, most of the time, been enough to eat. And it's just a question, and who can afford it? And the ecological crisis will happen like this. People, some people will adapt easily because they have the means, they have the culture, they are in the right place in the world. Some people will, will not. And the uh, big question is, oh, humanity will choose to uh, react, we chose to share the burden, we chose to help each other and so on. And this is something where uh, the future is not set, where everything can still open, can still happen. And uh, this is also really converging with the question of um, reducing emissions and reducing pollution in the third place, because it's a collaboration issue. So mm -hmm. my message is that, um, I'm not sure that uh, our future is worse than what our children, what our parents, our grandparents were fearing, but like the Third World War, the nuclear apocalypse, and so on, which are, which are still risks uh, nowadays. And uh, we, and we, we are adults. We have some kind of power and uh, ways to influence the world. We can decide collectively. My name is August Weber. I'm from the Netherlands. I'm a alumni student of the UVA of Amsterdam. Um, last year, I did some research on the limits to growth. Today, it's like of this year, it's 50 years ago that this report 
came out. It's a report, the first important report of the Club of Rome. Club of Rome started um, with spreading the message that we should do something about our climate. And they also uh, wrote about the impact of population growth uh, on the climate. And my question um, to you is, what do you think the impact of the report, the limits to growth had on the idea that population growth is uh, bad for the climate? Um, so just uh, to be a bit more precise, uh, the limits to growth is not really about the climate, it's more generally about resources and pollution in a more general sense. And it's, I think it's something that we have to understand, it's that it's a very general model. And it's not uh, like a uh, demographic projection, it's not a crystal ball, but it gives an idea or, of how some mechanism may happen. And I think the authors were clearer in the past about this, but they really said it gives an idea of uh, some risks, but it's not uh, a prediction. And actually, when things start to uh, get tougher and limits that to be reached and so on, the model doesn't doesn't stay right because rules will change, and so the the way that uh, things collapse in the limits to growth model is things collapse if nothing changes. And of course, actually, life, uh, human history is a very long collection of things changing or things not being everything else equal and so on. About the links uh, between the limits to growth and overpopulation fears, uh, I think the authors are a bit, uh, they are not very clear and they are the, the children of their time. Well, this was a very common fear. And they actually did a calculation in their book where they uh, choose that all the humanity goes to um, uh, 2.1 child by woman instantly. And it actually doesn't change much. It, I think it delays collides by two or three years. And so it's a very minor parameter. And at the same time, they have this discourse that population growth is very important, it's a risk and so on, and I don't think it's warranted by their reasons. And there are some sentences that really disturb me, like if population growth uh, is slower, it's still exponential, but the, co it's still but the coefficient is smaller, and it's not exponential if the coefficient goes smaller. And they are mathematicians, they should know it. And really, it's not their best, uh, the, the best part of the report. Yes, but also the effect on newspapers, at least in the Netherlands, was that it was like yes, yes, a doom they're, scenario they're created. Um, and everyone started to have less children, because if you had more children, where looked as uh, egoistic people and yeah it was the effect was very hard although hmm. maybe they didn't want this uh, kind of doom scenario to be spread all over the world but uh, hmm. the effect was enormous uh, it's something that I, i'll um, i look up because as far as i know there wasn't any baby crash when any of these books were published because actually even if they were bestsellers the population bomb or the limits to growth that didn't reach enough people to be seen in uh, birth rates. So I'll, I'll have a look. Maybe it's, uh, it's uh, in the Netherlands because globally in the world or in France or in the US, it doesn't show. But uh, thank you. I'll, uh, I'll... Um, hi, my name is Evelyn from Kenya, but unfortunately I can't stand on my, my, my camera because I lose connection. Sorry about that. Problem. So my question is, um, so we have seen policies and solution to the issue of climate change being made, but in the technological advancement era that we are in, do you think that these policies and solutions are actually working at a personal level or family level? Because um, I can give an example of here in Africa where families want to upgrade their homes from um, example, buying TVs, fridge etc and because we are the concept of moving from a developing country to a developed country 
actually includes technological um, advancement. So do you think these policies are working at a family level and at a personal level? I think there are two questions, um, and I tried to answer both. First, uh, if we think that everyone in the world has the right to similar standards of living, poor countries and Africa globally should develop. They should be richer, they should have more TVs, and richer countries should leave them some room to pollute more. And it's something that has to be accepted. We shouldn't, uh, the poorer people, People of the world shouldn't bear the burden of uh, decarbonization and uh, it's not their, their fault, it's not their responsibility and they have the right to a better life. Um, the second question is in the link between, um, I would say, individual or family level policies and uh, general policies. I'm very skeptical actually of individual questions or individual uh, consumption reductions, because in uh, a world that doesn't do much collectively to uh, reduce emissions and to reduce pollutions, the uh, pollution that you do not emit will mostly be done by someone else. And this is something um, that is really um, obvious in the ribbon defect. The Raymond effect is when you uh, have something that is more efficient, you will save money and you will maybe use this thing a bit more and save money that you will use on uh, something else. Uh, in the end, between 75% and under 100% of uh, your energy or pollution savings will be, uh, will be catched by uh, the Raymond effect and done elsewhere. So if we any uh, limited um, or any small cap efforts uh, usually swamped or, or uh, catched by other uh, changes. And so we have uh, at national or international levels uh, decide uh, to decide bigger policies, bigger scale policies. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I am Peter Chijoke Ani from Nigeria. I have a very simple question. And uh, the question is, what can family do to slow down the process of climate change? What can family do to slow down the process of climate change? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as individuals and as families, um, I think the best thing we can do is to engage politically or in syndicate or in syndicates or in associations and uh, on things that have a bigger impact than just your own consumption. So of course, uh, eating less meat is good, uh, using an electric car is good, stopping flying is good and so on. These are the, the big, the big uh, ticket items when you reduce uh, your personal footprint, but it's always more important and it has to go together to uh, engage in social change. Um, Victor Molnar, I'm a volunteer at NOE, and I would like to ask you, you mentioned this idea of more developed countries offering financial support to developing countries if they actually lower their population or at least the ch children that they are having. Uh, my question is, what if the government actually decides to take this, but then how would they enforce it in a way? Because I know in Hungary, there are a, co a heavy culture in various uh, culture groups that put heavy emphasis on having a big family and how would the government actually do anything about changing their cultural view of no, don't have five kids, don't have six kids, because these uh, families usually have their children as a, as a second policy, as a, a backup plan in case they don't have anywhere else to go when they are older. This is their uh, retirement plan, that when they cannot go and work, they can move in with their kids. And if they only have one kid, there is a risk that if something happens with that kid, then they are left alone because 
they maybe don't have enough when they go to retirement and they don't have anyone else to look after them. So how would the government actually have to incite these people to don't have this backup plan in case something goes wrong in their life? Thank you. I, I think the simplest answer would be to simply offer public pension plans so that people have uh, pensions or uh, health care and so on, whether they have children or not. And it's one of the many, many, many ways uh, that uh, fertility rates go down in the world. So there is this phenomenon that we call the demographic transition, is that when the mortality is high, people have many children, and then mortality goes down, and it takes some time to, for the fertility to go down after this. And there are tons of other uh, mechanisms that, that are cultural, that are economic, that are social security, that are uh, about uh, politics, that are about uh, freedom, of, especially of women to choose, that are about education and opportunities. And all of this help uh, to uh, reduce fertility rates when, 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 and only in this case, people want to actually have less children. And it's, uh, it's a, it can be a very long phenomenon. Like in, in uh, Europe, it took around 200 years for, natality, for fertility rates to go down around two children by, two children by a woman. Uh, it can be pretty fast in Iran, for example, it took 20 years because it was uh, a rather rich country with good education, good healthcare systems, um, with a strong political and religious power and so on. So when nothing uh, of these tools are, are useful, the only thing left is coercion, which could be fines when you have more children, which can be uh, preference for some government jobs and so on. Everything of this is currently happening, for example, in India, if you look for what's uh, Uttar Pradesh. Um, the government of Uttar Pradesh has chosen several measures to discourage people from having so many, too many children. And of course, it applies to minorities more, and it always uh, causes issues. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is George Mani from Cameroon. Emmanuel, thank you for your presentation. A very tough topic. And uh, my question is looking at the young generation here in Africa. Uh, they are very well concerned about this question of children, uh, more concerned than uh, the fathers and uh, the grandparents who are not involved in, in this because uh, you know how baby boom in Africa is. But uh, do you think today, what could be the best advice to give to this uh, young generation? Do you listen to what is going on in the world and uh, the concern of uh, children, uh, baby boom in, uh, <clears throat> in the, not the baby boom, uh, but uh, the question of children in the occidental part of the world? Or uh, do you fo let or follow the step of your father, your grandfather, and uh, continue to have uh, a lot of children uh, in your family? So what will be the best advice for, for this young generation today? Actually, I'm not sure. I'm not a, an expert about uh, African culture and what's, what are currently the debates and so on. Uh, one of the great questions about Africa currently is that the demographic transition is going slow because Africa is not developing fast enough for many reasons. And where, of course, rich countries have uh, quite a strong part. So uh, my, my advice for children who could hear this is really make your own choices. And I'm, I don't think we have to impose cultural norms and so on, and that people will uh, have their own norms evolve if uh, it fits their society, if it fits their, uh, their wishes and all their, um, their countries are evolving. So I... I, I'm not the best person to give uh, advice about uh, how many children you should have and what you should uh, you should believe. And I, I think it's something really important in this debate is that children and people more generally are uh, ends, not means. So uh, if you can uh, live in a world 
where uh, you see people as ends because you are not constrained by economical uh, issues or uh, having a pension or having someone to help you work. Treat your children as means and do what you think would be best for them. Your ch actual children or potential children. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you. As ends, of course, I said, I would say. Treat sure. your children as ends, not me. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. I myself have another question. It's like every country has a particular experience, but there's a general idea of youngsters to effectively not to have children nor families. Uh, not only for climate change reasons, but for other more. The question is, what is the main idea that we should change in this generation so we can um, encourage them to have more families in Manuel? Uh, I'm still not sure we should encourage people to have more families. I think we should encourage them to be free and make their own choices. And if uh, this is uh, have more children, and actually in rich countries or in low fertility countries, probably people have less children than they would wish, and mostly for social and economic reasons. And in uh, high fertility countries, people have more children than they would wish because of the lack of contraception or cultural norms and so on. And we should mostly try to help people uh, achieve their wishes about how many children um, they would like and help the children live, live in the best world they can live in. 